We're back, and welcome to the White House. <laughs> this, this afternoon's panel is going to simulate an, an emergency meeting of the principals of the National Security Council uh, to attempt to manage a crisis in the South China Sea. Today we have a distinguished group of former U.S. government officials who will play uh, cabinet members. And chairing our simulation and playing the role of national security advisor is former national security advisor, or former national security senior director for Asia, Mike Green. As you know, Mike is uh, CSIS senior vice president for Asia and Japan chair. He is uh, the bearded one, uh, just beyond Chris here. Um, next to him is uh, the former assistant secretary of state for uh, political military affairs, Andrew Shapiro. He'll be playing the part of Secretary of State. Andrew is now uh, the, is the founder and, uh, and managing director of Beacon Global Strategies. Next to him, uh, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian Pacific Affairs, uh, Chip Gregson. He will be playing the Secretary of Defense. He's now with the Center for Nas the National Interest. And uh, at the end, former National Intelligence Officer for East Asia, at the National Security or at the National Intelligence Council, Bob Sutinger will be playing the Director of National Intelligence, and he's currently with the Stimson Center. On my right, and uh, and the briefer for today is our Senior Advisor and Freeman Chair in China Studies, Chris Johnson, who uh, has briefed the real the real deal uh, many times uh, in his career. So I'm going to leave stage because it's not appropriate for a non-cabinet member to be up here. And uh, over to you guys. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, let me uh, provide you with an update on uh, what we're seeing going on uh, in the situation today. Over the last 72 hours, we've seen a rapid escalation of tensions in the South China Sea between China and the Philippines. Three days ago, the Philippine Coast Guard reported arresting a dozen Chinese fishermen for allegedly poaching in waters near Half Moon Shoal in the disputed Spratly Islands. That shoal lies just off the coast of the Philippine island of Palawan and is under Manila's effective jurisdiction. It's been the site of run-ins between Philippine forces and Chinese fishermen on multiple occasions, as you know. Beijing demanded the fishermen's immediate release, uh, but in this case, Manila refused. Then, approximately 48 hours ago, Chinese authorities, in an apparent retaliation, told their Philippine counterparts that Beijing was instituting a complete air and naval blockade of the Philippine troops occupying 2nd Thomas Shoal, effective immediately. 2nd Thomas, called uh, Anyin in the Philippines, is another disputed reef in the Spratly Islands. It's about 105 nautical miles away from the Philippines and has been under Philippine control for 15 years. Uh, as you know, in 1999, the Philippines intentionally grounded the BRP Sierra Madre uh, on the shoal as a means to, of maintaining a military presence on the feature and blocking further Chinese expansion following the 1995 occupation of Mischief Reef. Beijing protested that grounding, the, the grounding, but Manila has refused to remove the ship. The Sierra Madre is now uh, little more than a rusted out hull, but is still houses a rotating detachment of about eight Filipino Marines. Chinese Coast Guard vessels also began stepping up patrols near 2nd Thomas in 2012 and have maintained a constant presence around the shoal since at least mid-2013, regularly uh, harassing approaching vessels. Run-ins with the Philippine Navy have been frequent and have forced the latter to rely on civilian fishing vessels to ferry supplies and replacement troops to the Sierra Madre. In early March of this year, Chinese Coast Guard vessels blocked a ship carrying supplies and replacing troops from reaching the shoal, as you all are aware. The Philippines managed to airdrop supplies to the garrison three days later, but were unable uh, to rotate out their troops for the rest of the month. On March 29th, a civilian supply ship with replacement troops managed to reach the shoal despite being pursued by a Chinese Coast Guard ship that repeatedly approached dangerously close on several occasions and crossed the vessel's bow and killed its engines, nearly causing a, a collision. The Philippine ship escaped only when it, it entered shallow waters that the Chinese vessel could not traverse on its own. After that, things have been relatively quiet near the shoal until yesterday. Since announcing the new blockade, the Chinese Coast Guard has scared off civilian resupply vessel headed for 2nd Thomas. It also appears that China is reinforcing the number of ships near the shoal and has aircraft regularly patrolling overhead. 
The Philippines has uh, decried the Chinese blockade, as we might expect, uh, which it's calling an act of aggression and is now asking the international community, and especially the United States, a treaty ally, uh, for support. Regarding U.S. assets uh, in the region, our closest are two littoral combat ships based at Changi in Singapore and a guided missile destroyer currently visiting Subic Bay. Uh, we also have B-52 bombers and RQ-4 unmanned aerial vehicles based at Guam. And further away, there is an amphibious ready group in Sasebo, Japan, and a full U.S. Marine Corps complement on Okinawa. Uh, the USS George Washington and its battle group uh, is currently operating in the Western Pacific, about three days sail from 2nd Thomas. Uh, that's all we know at the moment, and uh, we certainly will keep you guys updated uh, going forward as we get more information. Uh, thank you, um, Chris. Um, it seems to me that um, while we've dealt with a variety of uh, uh, tensions and growing um, interactions uh, between China and her neighbors in this maritime domain, including our own forces. Uh, this one stands out uh, for several reasons. Um, the arrest of Chinese fishermen is going to put enormous pressure on Beijing to take actions that could be uh, deeply problematic for our interests. Uh, and the complete air and naval blockade uh, by the Chinese side uh, is going to force action on uh, Manila's part, and as we've heard, um, uh, the expectation of uh, steps on our part under our alliance uh, with Manila. I was just in the Oval Office with the President. Uh, this issue has um, his focus. He asked me three questions. Um, first, what's happening? And then he asked, do we have a dog in this fight? And then he asked, if we do, what are we going to do about it? Uh, I told him we'd be meeting, that we would formulate options for him, um, that we would get back to him by 5 p.m. Uh, tonight for a possible NSC meeting with him tomorrow morning. So uh, with the limited time we have, I'd like to ask first uh, the DNI to answer the what's happening question. We heard the tactical picture. What's your take on it? Uh, and in particular, um, what do you see as the drivers for Chinese behavior um, for the Philippines? And how is this looking in the region? Um, and then I'd like to turn to the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense for the questions uh, of what's at stake for us. Do we have a dog in this fight? What are the outcomes we want? But let's start with the intel picture with the DNI. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, just a couple of quick questions to follow up so I have a better sense uh, of what the tactical perspective on this is. Uh, when you say a full air and naval blockade of the Philippines' uh, forces in the region, are you talking about uh, the PLA Navy uh, and the PLA Air Force, or are you talking about more Coast Guard uh, and fishing uh, administration vessels? So far, it's the civ more civilian oriented. And the aircraft are also uh, not, not military? That's correct. <clears throat> A couple of points is he, that even though this, this does represent yet one more step uh, in what the, uh, some Chinese government commentators have called their, their cabbage strategy of sort of in, in, involving uh, leaf by leaf further steps uh, toward enforcing their maritime claims, uh, that this does not necessarily represent a wholesale change uh, in the perspective. Uh, another question that I have is really where are the Chinese fishermen at this point? We don't have much information on that because they're very difficult to track, obviously, but our sense is they've largely left the area given the blockade. Okay. Um, why are the Chinese doing this, of course, is the question that everybody wants to know, and I think the obvious answer to that is because they can. Um, they hold the preponderance of, uh, of military force uh, and as well as uh, fisheries force and any other uh, kind of measurement you want to take in the region. They have been arguing these issues over time um, for uh, many years, and they are simply taking a step, one f more step, it's not an unprecedented step, but one more step to in in enforce uh, and to get the world to recognize uh, their, their territorial claims in the region. Uh, the Philippines has been among the most vociferous uh, of those denying and, and, uh, and, and countering those claims. Uh, and the Chinese are taking a step uh, to kind of reinforce their position with respect to the Philippines and, and to make, make it clear that, uh, that they can take further steps in order to make things even more painful for the Philippines government. Why are they doing this? You can ask a variety of questions about uh, the nature of the regime. You can ask strategic questions about whether or not this is really aimed at the United States. Um, I think that at, Kind of the baseline judgment on this is that this does represent um, an, an action that is 
a little bit more typical of the kind of approach that Xi Jinping takes toward politics, uh, not only internationally but domestically as well. This is about power. Uh, and power is the, 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 the coin of the realm. Uh, inside the regime in Beijing, Xi Jinping has been accumulating it. Uh, he's been using it fairly ruthlessly against uh, people who are uh, perceived at least to be his opponents uh, domestically. And I think that we can assume that over time he is going to continue to, uh, to use Chinese power as it is within his uh, purview and within his remit uh, to do so. So I think that, that uh, this represents not an overwhelmingly strong challenge uh, to the international order in the region, but it certainly does represent uh, another step in making sure that people understand that China is a power to be reckoned with, that this area, whether you want to delimit it uh, legally or any other way, uh, is within China's uh, sphere of power. And they are going to act in that sphere uh, as they choose to, when they choose to, and according to their own rules. How will the region react? I think the region is going to become even a little bit more panicky. Uh, they are going to look for uh, the United States to reassure them that, uh, that these uh, steps will not go uh, unnoticed or uh, unresponded to. I think there will be more and more calls for uh, ASEAN uh, to uh, begin to understand what its responsibilities are in this area. Uh, but as always, there will be countervailing uh, approaches taken by uh, the economic uh, uh, forces within every government saying, no, we're, we're increasingly reliant on the Chinese economy for our own well-being. Uh, and therefore, we need to damp down this crisis as quickly as possible. Let me turn to Andrew. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, to answer the President's question about what is our dog in this fight, um, this administration has made the rebalance or pivot to Asia one of its core components of its foreign policy. And so uh, instability in Asia is, uh, it causes the United States uh, to have direct interests uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, so, uh, there will be a number of different audiences who will be in Asia, which will be closely monitoring how we respond to this crisis and how, as part of our rebalance, what does that mean? What is the content of that rebalance? How deeply do we plan to be engaged? So for example, our treaty allies, like the Philippines, but also Japan, will want to see to the extent to which we're willing to stand by our commitments. The ASEAN nations, who are both concerned about uh, Chinese overreaching in their territorial claims, but also have deep economic relationships with China, so they want to make sure that we don't uh, uh, mismanage the crisis in a way that could deeply impact their, their economies. The Chinese will be looking to see how we will respond and whether they can, the aggressive behavior will be um, responded to. And then finally, it's a key component of U.S. foreign policy that these types of disputes should be uh, addressed through the rule of law and not through the use of force. And so any, uh, any attempt to solve these types of issues through the use of force has to be challenged lest it turn into um, uh, uh, an arms race uh, as determining who will be able to um, uh, have access to certain territories in the uh, South China Sea and in the Pacific more generally. But it's also important for our global goals. Um, if we're asking that maritime security issues be treated uh, according to the rule of law, but we don't live up to that, then in places like the Arctic, which is really turning into uh, uh, um, uh, a place where uh, maritime claims uh, are going to be more relevant as the global um, uh, ice uh, recedes and there's more and more ability to uh, have ships go through there, if we don't have a rule of law framework, then it'll be a mad rush uh, there as well, which would be detrimental to U.S. interests. Uh, so I think that we uh, need to show that we can responsibly manage a crisis such as this in a way that reinforces our core policy goals of a, a, a safe, stable, secure uh, Asia-Pacific region, which addresses uh, um, crises through the use of uh, legal instruments, not through the use of force. Thank you. Defense? Let me stipulate that the Secretary of Defense is in full agreement with my colleague, the Secretary of State, uh, sometimes an unusual occurrence in the White House sit room. Uh, 
the options that we have on the defense side are a bit complex, and it might be easiest to frame it at the two extremes and then walk back towards the middle. One is do nothing. Uh, I don't recommend that for all the reasons that uh, our alliance credibility is at stake here, not just with the Philippines, but with the rest of Asia. The uh, other extreme is to respond immediately with a mass, <clears throat> pardon me, a massive force flow, uh, repositioning of ships, airplanes, and things. I don't necessarily recommend that either, but somewhere in the middle, we have to make sure that we can react. We are not without assets in addition to the ones, uh, to the forces that were mentioned by the uh, National Security Advisor, we also have the first of the first special force, first battalion of the first special forces group on Okinawa, uh, and we have other assets in, in the region. Since it is primarily civilian vessels that are enforcing this blockade at the moment, it's probably more attractive to use civilian vessels, Philippine vessels, to affect any resupply or rotation of personnel. I'd recommend that we have appropriate U.S. personnel on these ships so that we have solid communications and develop a solid picture of what's happening. I also recommend that the assets that the National Security Advisor mentioned that are days away from the Philippines uh, be sortied so that they are closer but still over the horizon, not visible, but still ready to react as one of our objectives has to be being able to control escalation and to be prepared to counter Chinese escalation if it, uh, if it should happen. We need to be able to make sure that we maintain the ability to uh, act in our own interest uh, without having to wait. Let me um, push both secretaries. Um, I think there's a clear consensus that um, we need to take steps to ensure that uh, the use of coercive tools um, is not successful uh, and uh, that uh, rule of law and diplomatic um, processes to resolve these kinds of issues um, uh, become the, the norm, including for the People's Republic of China. Um, we need to avoid escalation. That means having a deterrence capability, as the Secretary of Defense said. Um, it also means thinking of off-ramps or ways to de-escalate. Um, I think the President's going to ask us, though, um, whether in this specific case we are trying to return to a status quo ante, in other words, demonstrate that um, the uh, air and naval uh, blockade of uh, the Philippine um, uh, the forces uh, has not succeeded, if it's enough to get back to the status quo ante, or whether this is a significant enough escalation by the Chinese side that we need to impose a cost that in order to restore deterrence and dissuasion, uh, ensure that coercion is not tried again, we actually have to make sure that there is some price paid diplomatically uh, or otherwise by Beijing for this. So that's the thing I think he's going to ask us. Um, are we simply trying to keep the um, access of the Philippines to their facility, or are we trying to actually uh, impose a cost on China for escalating? And the second thing we need to figure out is what is our position on the Chinese fishermen, which it seems to me will put enormous pressure on Beijing um, to demonstrate uh, that, that, that Manila will pay a price for using domestic law to arrest Chinese fishermen on what the Chinese will argue and will be um, forced to confront domestically, uh, that uh, under the Chinese uh, position, uh, politically and in policy, this is Chinese territory, and the Philippines are now arrested under Philippine domestic law, Chinese citizens. So there are two dimensions I'd like to get a little bit more of a comment from you. Do we need to um, take steps that cause the Chinese escalation to fail, or do we have to go further and impose a cost? And if so, what and how do we do that? And secondly, how do we avoid escalation by China, uh, or should we um, not uh, interfere on this question with respect to the Chinese fishermen the Philippines now have, um, and presumably will prosecute under domestic law, as seeing things now appear. Uh, state. Well, I, I think we need to understand that this has become a very emotional issue in both countries, and in both China because of the arrest of the fishermen in the Philippines uh, because of the blockade. Um, and I think that if we were successful in having the uh, air and sea blockades uh, standing down, that would be a diplomatic accomplishment, which would also send a signal to the Chinese that this type of behavior will not be tolerated, that there will be a response, and that um, they do not get the benefits of this type of behavior. Um, there's a risk in trying to impose additional costs in that it could uh, cause the emotions to then uh, 
become even uh, deeper and harder to overcome. Uh, so my recommendation would be to try and get out of this crisis as, as quickly and as smoothly as we can, and then you know, use the lessons of this crisis, both uh, regionally and multilaterally, to ch put additional pressure uh, on claimants in the region to follow a legal process rather than the use of force. Um, uh, and, and so on the, on the uh, Chinese fishermen, I think, again, it's gonna be an emotional uh, issue for the, for the Filipinos, but at the end of the day, if we can demonstrate that um, the Chinese tactics did not work, there may be, it may encourage greater flexibility on the Filipino side. So for the Secretary of Defense, feel free to weigh in on, on these questions, but how can we cause, uh, or do we have the, the means, as we understand the situation, to convince the Chinese to stand down on the blockade or to um, cause it to fail because uh, the Philippines are able to, uh, in spite of Chinese actions, continue supplying uh, their personnel? It depends on how much the Chinese are prepared to commit to this. The Philippine assets are, are limited. Uh, so far, we've had no exchanges of lethal force uh, uh, I don't know in a scenario if you postulated water cannons or any of that nonsense, but uh, we, we've, there, there's a couple steps to take before we get to that. Uh, there's a high possibility that uh, even if the National Command Authority in China is not encouraging violence, that uh, incidents will take their own course and emotions will take their own course in the area. And that's why I emphasize that we need to be able to uh, dominate the escalation ladder, at least initially, to discourage it from, uh, from going higher. Uh, so bottom line, can we break the, block, can we break the blockade uh, with, the, uh, with the Philippine assets? It depends on what the Philippines have available and what they're prepared to commit. We need to be prepared to commit U.S. assets, if necessary, to, to break the blockade and to have enough force that is visible to the Chinese but not visible locally <clears throat> that we can dominate any escalation that China decides to take. Does the DNI have an assessment on Chinese counter steps? Well, uh, before I get to that point, I'd like to ask uh, the Secretary of State uh, whether, I mean, these are fishermen. Um, the, uh, one other recourse that might be considered would be to just confiscate the catch and kick them out. Uh, is that something that the Philippine government is willing to consider, uh, or is this uh, an issue on which uh, they are prepared to go to the wall? I just, uh, you know, on the basis of the information that's been, been presented so far, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know the answer to that question, um, but I would like to have it considered. Well, uh, my sense is, as, as I mentioned, this is a very emotional issue in the Philippines right now, and as long as there is an air and sea blockade, it will be uh, challenging uh, to uh, convince the uh, Filipinos to give up the fishermen. But in the context of an agreement where the blockade uh, were to end, uh, if the fishermen were returned, that may offer a diplomatic solution um, that, while not, not necessarily satisfying to either side, may provide a way uh, for both sides to, um, to de-escalate. It seems to me that um, we have uh, the objectives of uh, uh, deterring Chinese escalation, <clears throat> dissuading China from thinking this kind of action will work, and avoiding escalation. And avoiding escalation is going to involve some of the deterrence options the Secretary of Defense mentioned in terms of other U.S. assets in the region. <clears throat> um, but also, it seems to me that avoiding escalation uh, may involve us talking to our friends in Manila about steps they can take. Um, uh, that uh, prevent, us, prevent the Chinese side from taking further steps. We know from the Japanese case, for example, in the Senkakus, <laughs> that um, when the, a much stronger state with a much more capable military um, uh, arrested Chinese fishermen and began to prosecute them, <laughs> um, the Chinese response was pretty ferocious. So it seems to me uh, we might want to consider options for the president that involve a combination of reassurance to Manila, including some of these deterrent steps, a willingness, as the Secretary of Defense said, to help them reinforce their forces on 2nd Thomas Shoal, <clears throat> um, declaratory policy that makes that position clear, um, and ask quietly, 
uh, that Manila take some steps to help de-escalate with respect to the fishermen. Does that seem like a framework that might uh, achieve the objectives and use the instruments you mentioned? I, 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 th I think that's right. I think that for the Philippines to be able to dem show that they didn't, you know, cave in this crisis will be important. Uh, and that a reaffirmation of the U.S. security commitment to the Philippines uh, through a variety of measures along the lines of what you discussed can enable them to then say that they are, um, have the flexibility to take de-escalatory steps uh, for this crisis. And along with that, uh, we might want to consider the messaging on the release of the fishermen that uh, we are not maintain. we are not, we, our, our ally, the Philippines, is not maintaining custody of these or incarcerating these fishermen with no reason, unlike what China does internally, and make sure that message reaches the Chinese people in whatever ways we can get it across. Uh, no, no, I agree. We would have to handle discussions with Manila about the um, steps to be taken with respect to the arrested Chinese fishermen with great delicacy because it's a matter of internal uh, domestic uh, Philippines law, but under, uh, under Philippine law, as I understand it, and consistent with a, state, a country that respects rule of law, um, there could be some uh, initial procedural steps taken and they can be released. Um, there are two other aspects I think we need to consider for the president. Uh, if this approach is effective, it will help de-escalate and it will help um, restore a certain level of uh, reassurance uh, for our allies and deterrence. But the Secretary of Defense mentioned, we and the Secretary of State, we may need to take other steps given the um, nature of the Chinese moves in this case. It is a degree higher than what we've seen. And granted, we've had a series of sort of gradual escalatory steps in these kinds of, uh, of uh, I incidents, <clears throat> but we may need to think about um, longer term measures that we take, uh, as the Secretary of State said, after we've de-escalated uh, to demonstrate the um, futility of this kind of course of approach. It seems to me something where we um, uh, work with other allies in the region to help the Philippines with um, their maritime patrol and maritime domain awareness capacity, perhaps Australia, Japan, maybe Korea might be on order. Some sort of um, work with ASEAN um, uh, to solidify support for the Philippines. It's always hard with ASEAN, but try to get some um, uh, common position, uh, not just calling for code of conduct, but something a little bit more perhaps um, and maybe changes in our exercise schedule. I don't know, but let me put that on the table uh, as the final issue I think we need to resolve for now. What are the next steps we need to take once we've helped to de-escalate to ensure that we've um, uh, uh, made these kinds of incidents less, less likely uh, going forward? And I would add in that, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult, but we need to push for confidence building transparency uh, with the PLA and with the Chinese um, paramilitary Coast Guard forces, not just for us, but for other maritime states in the region. So I welcome some uh, closing comments at this point on those uh, next step or near term to long term options. Well, I think you hit it on the head in that we do need to take um, steps in the region to demonstrate our commitment to our treaty partners as well as demonstrate that this type of behavior will not uh, lead to benefits, that there's actually costs to this type of behavior. One aspect of it will be our regional um, uh, positioning. We'll, we should work with our partners and allies, uh, Japan, Australia, Korea, and others, um, on uh, making sure that this type of behavior is denounced and perhaps uh, joint exercises and the like that show that our commitment to uh, freedom of navigation. Uh, uh, um, I think we should work through ASEAN, try and multilateralize this as well. And there's been some success in the past in putting pressure on the Chinese. I think we have to recognize that the Chinese have been less likely to succumb to multilateral um, uh, pressure than they were perhaps a couple years ago. But th that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to, um, to, to try and to, to make that clear. And it also helps build support for the United States within ASEAN for the principle of uh, freedom of navigation according to the rule of law. Um, we should think about, you know, we just signed this agreement with the Philippines. How do we take advantage of that? How, what, what type of exercises or deployments enable us to take advantage of that? Is there anything, you know, with the Marines in Australia, exercises or the like that also demonstrate our commitment there as well? So there's another th number of things that we could do with our partners there that can show that we're, because of this behavior, we are ratcheting up our engagement. If the goal was to 
to, to pressure us to withdraw, it's actually leading to the opposite result. We're actually going to be even more engaged. I think one of the things that, uh, that would help on the defense side is uh, to understand that the concept we're working with here is the rule of law. And what is bedeviling us uh, is our inability to enforce the rule of law due to lack of access, lack of, not, lack of assets, not access, and lack of maritime domain awareness. Uh, I think uh, we have the technology, I know we have the technology, but I think it would be advisable in the wake of this incident to immediately start with maritime domain awareness and with cooperative partners in ASEAN put installations all along the coast of the East and the South China Sea that would give us a complete MDA, maritime domain awareness, picture of surface traffic, whether it's fishermen or whether it's naval combatants, and make this public on a publicly accessible website on a daily basis so that everybody knows where everybody else is and that uh, when we get one of these incidents with the illegal fishermen, uh, everybody will be able to be in the jury, so to speak, to, uh, to know who was moving where and who, who started the incident. Secondly, we should accelerate efforts already ongoing within the strongest forms of our alliance over there, the U.S.-Japan-Australia axis, and vastly integrate uh, the capabilities of our forces. This means uh, doing those things to create the conditions of interoperability so that our forces, when we're operating together, are much, much more effective uh, than operating separately. Uh, uh, the conditions that apply with uh, air and missile defense pertain very much to this. We can't be flying our airplanes inside Japanese airspace without detailed tactical level integration at a split-second basis on where everybody is. Uh, demonstrating this type of integration, particularly in the, uh, in the naval context here, or the, no, naval's the wrong word, maritime context, uh, between forces or among forces in the air, on land and at sea of our alliances, starting with the foundation, US, Japan, Australia, and then extending it to the Philippines while we simultaneously build up their forces capability, our force presence in the Philippines, and most importantly, the capabilities of their maritime uh, safety and maritime security agencies, the civilian equivalents. Um, I think a, a, a greater presence of the U.S. forces that we already have in Asia, a greater uh, presence of those forces amongst all the nations uh, that are willing to accept this presence on a rotational for training basis uh, temporary deployments, in other words, uh, a, a vastly increasing that so that China sees that as a result of their assertiveness and their aggressiveness that what it is doing is pushing the, our allies and the United States closer together, not just the hub and spoke, our allies with us, but uh, hub spoke and then the, the, the rim around there were, for example, we have Japanese forces training in Australia, which they've already brought up. Japanese forces training in the Philippines, and that's not a reach anymore because of the uh, effect in the Philippines of the Japanese efforts in Typhoon Haiyan, where they were the second force in there right behind the United States. Uh, this type of thing will, uh, I think, demonstrate a degree of dissuasion. Uh, at the same time, I think it provides a much higher degree of reassurance with our allies, which will, in turn, make our allies, I think, feel more comfortable at, for example, finding some way out of this thing where they arrested these fishermen. Now they have the problem of what do we do with them without looking like we're, like we're caving in. So I uh, would recommend at this point um, we have the uh, PCC or IPC um, uh, take this uh, approach and analysis and meet tonight um, and formulate a briefing paper for the NSC meeting with the president tomorrow. Um, we'll have the uh, Senior Director for Asia, the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia Pacific Affairs and Paul Mill, um, ASD for APSA and the NIO Free East Asia lead on this because as we all know, they are the most outstanding and respected members of the U.S. government <laughs> and never fail to come up with the perfect briefing memos <laughs> at two in the morning. So with that, uh, I think we're in good shape, although I understand um, uh, from the Situation Room that we have an update from the Intel community, so maybe we should hear that before we break. That's correct, sir. Uh, get comfortable uh, in your seat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've just learned that the Philippine Navy uh, attempted to resupply the Marines at Second Thomas Shoal via helicopter as it did in March. 
uh, as the chopper approached to within about 12 nautical miles of the shoal, ignoring uh, radio warnings to turn back, two Chinese Coast Guard helicopters air, uh, repeatedly approached dangerously close to the helicopter. The Philippine chopper was forced to turn back to avoid a collision. Uh, meanwhile, aerial surveillance has confirmed a rapid increase in the number of Chinese Coast Guard ships surrounding the shoal, including several larger cutters dispatched from Hainan and the presence of, a, of several PLA Navy vessels, People's Liberation Army Navy vessels, at Mischief Reef, a mere 20 nautical miles away. Uh, Manila now has no good options left to resupply its Marines aboard the Sierra Madre, who are reportedly dangerously short on food and fresh water. Uh, defense and foreign officials in Manila are quietly asking uh, through uh, our various diplomatic and intelligence channels there if the United States would be willing to intervene, uh, possibly by breaking the Chinese blockade, as you've been discussing, before the situation escalates any further. Um, that's all we have for now, sir. Um, all right. Well, this is what um, in the National Security Committee we call not good. <laughs> um, uh, a number of, of concerns. I'm going to turn to the DNI first to try to make sense of what this escalatory step means before we take a second look at our options going forward and, and the implications. Um, I don't know if we know this, but we, I assume that the, um, the Republic of the Philippines effort to reinforce Second Thomas Shoal helicopter was done unilaterally? That is correct. Okay, that is deeply problematic in terms of how we both showed a, a common front for purposes of deterrence and how we avoid escalation. We need to consider that. Um, the presence of PLAN uh, Navy, uh, PLAN uh, surface uh, combatants 20 miles away is not good, uh, is an escalation. Um, and obviously there's pressure on us because Manila's call for help spotlights our actions for the entire region. Let me turn first to the DNI and see um, how the intelligence community assesses this new development. Well, from a, from a very quick and dirty perspective, um, this does not necessarily constitute an escalation. Um, there was an effort to resupply, which presumably the Philippines would declare was in, within their right to try and do. Uh, that was uh, turned back. Uh, as one would have expected, there would be efforts to turn it back. Um, so unless um, there are further steps that are taken, this really represents only a slight uh, increase in the levels of tension that are already present in the region. So how we and the Philippines decide to respond to this uh, is really going to be the key to where this situation goes from here. Um, it, this doesn't, you know, the presence of the PLA Navy, they're not ever very far away, so I don't think that necessarily uh, implies a, a threat uh, to, to try and resolve this through the Navy. I think that if the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy does become involved, or if the People's Liberation Army Air Force does become involved, then you are talking about a serious escalation uh, of the nature of this crisis. So it is uh, certainly within the realm of possibility, but we ain't there yet. So I think the, uh, the question still uh, comes around to uh, how do you uh, send messages, how do you signal uh, in ways that don't create the perception that we are escalating this crisis? Uh, and that, that, that seems to me, I, you know, this the DNI is not in a position uh, to, uh, to, to make policy recommendations. Uh, but certainly we do need to monitor the perceptions uh, of all sides uh, to make sure that, that the, whatever efforts we make, whatever steps we take, uh, are perceived clearly as uh, an effort to resolve the crisis rather than to make it worse. But, so I think we should um, uh, include in our uh, uh, assessment of the situation, the DNI's um, observation that uh, the respective moves by both Manila and Beijing are within the bounds of what one might expect and does not necessarily represent a strategic level escalation. However, it's moving us quickly down the path where we could have escalation that does serious damage to um, stability uh, and our interests and credibility in the region. So I think we need to think with a little more urgency about what our options are. Mr. Secretary? Um, a few things. Um, given the Filipino attempt to resupply and the response, we as the United States are going to have to now make sure that we are closely coordinating with the Philippines to avoid further unilateral actions that may further aggravate the situation, both because we don't want the situation to spiral out of control, but if it's perceived that the Philippines are mismanaging the crisis, they'll lose regional support and we'll lose, you know, the ability to bring in regional support for for our position. So we will need to, you know, ensure that the Philippines do not, you know, uh, continue to take unilateral actions in this crisis. We're going to need to deeply invest ourselves 
in the resolution of this crisis uh, and, and to work closely with the Philippine, Filipino government. Um, I think we're now at a point where we understand that these, you know, um, uh, Marines are, are close to starvation, so the clock is ticking in terms of how long they can stay there without resupply. Um, so, and it seems to me that an option where they withdraw um, because they are out of supplies would be perceived as a victory for the Chinese in the region. And so we need to figure out a way uh, to ensure that that outcome does not happen. And so it, it, it leads to what are our options for the potential to resupply, and it may not even be that we need to, but indicating a willingness to do so may send a signal to the Chinese that this crisis is, is now no longer just about uh, China and the Philippines, but it risks becoming a more serious one. And if, we're, if we can credibly uh, you know, make that uh, uh, clear to the Chinese, there's a chance that we could come to a negotiated diplomatic solution that enables the Chinese to withdraw the blockade and, and the fishermen would be free to return to China. To, uh, to clarify, you're talking about, um, in your second point, signaling publicly that the United States would yeah. be prepared? I would do it quietly with the Chinese. Uh, if you do it publicly, uh, for now, uh, if you do it publicly, the Chinese, then it puts them in a real public box. Uh, and so I would try and do it as, as I would make clear that we have the ability to do so and then quietly send the message that we're not going to let these Marines, you know, starve as a result of the blockade. And if necessary, we'll use U.S. assets, U.S. ships or helicopters to do the mission? Exactly. Um, Secretary of Defense? Uh, concur, and we can uh, widely publicize uh, the next uh, Philippine resupply attempt as a strictly humanitarian mission uh, and uh, start taking to start taking control of the narrative away from China, that uh, this is not a military move, all those things, and that uh, uh, we're resupplying the all 12 Marines on, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, derelict ship there in the Shoals uh, as a humanitarian reason, and that they should stand clear and let this mission, mission go ahead. So if, they, if they don't, then we should have enough uh, uh, assets to be able to force this through later. So uh, that I understand so that we can explain to the president at the NSC meeting tomorrow, um, we would have to, I assume, be prepared to use force, if necessary, to defend our assets, even if they are engaged in the humanitarian mission resupplying the Philippines Marines. In other words, we'd have to be prepared to take this to the next level if our own resupply efforts were obstructed. I it, and I understand from the Secretary of Defense um, a slightly different take from the DN The DNI's view was that, uh, that China has a preponderance of naval and air power. I assume, Mr. Uh, Director, that was vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines. But is it your assessment for both the DNI and the Secretary of Defense that we, the United States, would have the preponderance of power at sea and in the air should we choose or be forced into a position of having to deploy it? Uh, total uh, forces, uh, the, the Chinese may have more numbers, but uh, this shoal is an awful lot closer to the Philippines and our potential bases in the Philippines than it is to any bases in China. So I'm quite sure we could establish local air and sea superior, air superiority there. And, and if the President asks, you're prepared to tell him that uh, while this would be an unarmed humanity, I presume, it would be an unarmed humanitarian mission, I assume, by a helicopter, by U.S. forces. If it comes to that, as I understand the Secretary of State's proposal, it's that we signal to the Chinese side quietly, we do not intend to let these Marines starve or be evacuated from Second Thomas Shoal. And if necessary, we will use our assets to uh, resupply them for humanitarian purposes. But the proposal is to get the Chinese to allow a humanitarian uh, supply mission from the Philippines. But if that fails or if it's refused, we are prepared to undertake that mission, but we're also unprepared, prepared to use compellants uh, to ensure that it happens. And th that is a potential escalatory step. I just want to make sure I understand correctly, because the president will, will want to know what he's getting himself into. Yes, that would be my position. Yeah, and I think our hope would be that, um, that our signaling a willingness to take this step 
would uh, make uh, the calculus of the Ch change the calculus of the Chinese in this crisis. Remember, the Chinese still need for their own economic and strategic goals um, the ability to have um, uh, free, uh, the ability to navigate the Pacific, and they view their the one barrier to their continued economic success is a potential conflict with the United States. And so to the extent that um, we make clear that this is the line, uh, the, the, uh, our estimation is that, you know, that they would not be willing to cross that line. Um, I'll turn to the DNI for an assessment on this, uh, on this point we're looking at now. Do we have the ability to judge um, Beijing's capacity for de-escalation for off-ramps um, do we know enough to know what the bottom line is uh, with respect to China's moves? Should we be forced down this particular avenue? No. <laughs> A resounding definitive answer. From well, it, I mean, the, the, the point is that, that when you uh, get yourself into a situation where you're in a public confrontation with China, um, forcing them to back down uh, is usually not a particularly good option. Uh, and it usually isn't one that's going to work very readily. Uh, and unless you are prepared to actually take some kinetic action uh, to, uh, to take out one of their newly formed uh, islands that they're making in the, in, in the region or to, uh, or to take out a Coast Guard cutter or something like that, uh, unless you're prepared to do that, you're really not going to get their attention because they do have uh, what they consider to be both the moral right to be there and uh, the physical capability to defend their interests. So by saying you're going to bring in uh, a couple of helicopters and we're only doing this for the Marines, et cetera, et cetera, it's not going to be compelling to them. Um, and and uh, all I'm saying is that, uh, that if you're going to get a change in behavior, uh, standing uh, nose to nose with them and shouting at them that they need to back down is probably not the way they're going to back down. Uh, I, but I agree with that, and which is why this needs to be managed very sensitively. It should not be public beating of the breast, you know, that we're going to force it through, and if you don't like it, try and stop us, because that, that is a recipe for escalating this crisis and making it more difficult to solve rather than less difficult. But however, I think quiet diplomacy here has the ability to send the, the signal of our seriousness. I think quiet diplomacy would be appreciated rather than the public breast beating. And that at the end of the day, we, it, you know, based on the response we get to the quiet, the quiet diplomacy, we can then decide what public you know, diplomacy posture we want to take. But we should not, you know, immediately try and turn this incident into a worldwide media crisis because it'll be harder to solve if you do that rather than try and engage in quiet diplomacy. This is not the first um, uh, use of coercion in a gray zone scenario by China by any means, and it probably won't be the last. Uh, is this the one where we draw the line? Um, uh, is this the one where we are prepared to uh, take steps with our forces to enforce a private signal that we are not going to allow these Marines to be uh, uh, to starve on on this uh, facility, and that we are prepared to make sure that either we or the Philippines reinforce them? Is this the one uh, where we have to draw the line? Has, has in, in effect, are we concluding that our efforts to date to dissuade this kind of coercion have failed? and we need to be prepared to take a firmer stand. Is that the premise behind your recommendations? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, and in the absence of a, an analysis that says that if we don't respond, if a failure to respond will merely embolden the Chinese to be more aggressive in the future. And so uh, they will continue to engage in this type of behavior. And we, if we decide, and the president decides, that it's in our national interest to prevent the Chinese from engaging in this type of behavior and continuing to engage in this type of behavior, there has to be a point at which we are willing to say no. Um, uh, and with a, when we have you know, a close ally and partner of ours asking for help, a failure to support them will be noticed in the region, and there could be 
quite detrimental circumstances if it's perceived that the U.S. is not willing to stand up to this type of behavior. Yeah, I'm, I'm prepared to recommend to the President, based on the uh, Principles Committee's um, discussion, that we um, send a signal to Beijing that um, we will uh, not allow the Philippine Marines to either starve or be forced to retreat, um, and that we are prepared to um, enforce that position. Um, obviously, a key part of the signal will be that we hope not to go there and that we seek um, to learn from this uh, incident to uh, establish more effective crisis management, de-escalation, code of conduct, and so forth. Um, that the President also speak with uh, the President of the Republic of the Philippines and um, uh, convey the same message but ask for some steps to help us de-escalate the ones we discussed earlier, perhaps with respect to the 12, uh, I think it's 12 Chinese fishermen who are under arrest. Um, that the Department of Defense prepare um, options for uh, deployments, uh, flexible deterrence options, um, uh, and uh, uh, the parameters of a humanitarian uh, 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 operation uh, by our forces if necessary. The piece that's missing, uh, it seems to me, and here the Secretary of Defense is going to have to help us, is I think the President will come back and say, um, are my options only uh, uh, allow this coercion to work or threaten U.S. forces? Is there something in the middle? Are there options to use U.S. capabilities, U.S. assets, U.S. intelligence to enhance the ability of the Philippines' own forces to handle this without us having a conspicuous uh, role, and, and in particular our military forces? Because these are, after all, still White Hull. It's the Philippine Navy, but it still is White Hull Coast Guard uh, uh, assets. Uh, from the Chinese side. They have not yet sent Gray Hull or PLA, and although we'd be engaged in a humanitarian mission, our Navy and Marine aircraft would be Navy and Marines. So is there some uh, sort of uh, below the radar but effective um, capability we can use to augment the Philippines' own uh, humanitarian operations, make sure their helicopters get through, make sure they have the right intelligence, the right support, and so forth? It's possible that uh, we could create a very rapid transfer of equipment and assets to the Philippines uh, that uh, has its own inherent risks. Uh, it also may not provide quite the, uh, um, the under the radar effort that you're thinking about, but uh, in the short term, that might be one of the best uh, opportunities that we have. All right, we'll have the uh, tired and overworked assistant secretaries and senior directors and senior NIOs get back uh, in the saddle and spend another uh, sleepless night in their offices. Uh, the only other piece I think is we'll need um, uh, the State Department in particular to come up with a diplomatic engagement plan and coordination plan vis-a-vis -vis, um, our key allies and partners. I think we'll want uh, perhaps um, uh, the ambassador to go in in Tokyo, Seoul, Canberra, and, and perhaps even National Security Council, uh, National Security Advisor or presidential or vice presidential calls <coughs> to the key allies. And we'll need a diplomatic strategy for other posts, um, not only in the Asia Pacific region, but worldwide, because this is, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a strategy that I think will lead to de-escalation, but it has the potential um, to make uh, headlines in the next few days. If it doesn't work, we're prepared for that. We'll tell the president that. We'll see if he accepts that uh, uh, when we meet with him tomorrow morning. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. NSC meetings are strictly confidential. I don't <laughs> <think>. <laughs>
I'll, I'll, I'll start if it's okay, and we'll, we'll all weigh in. Um, that is why I kept trying to look at the um, reassurance piece of visa piece vis-a-vis -vis Beijing and the escalation control strategy vis-a-vis -vis Manila, um, and why I thought the fishermen were so critical, because um, we need some, um, for lack of a better word, face-saving uh, so that the Chinese side can de-escalate. And, and some of the most important steps are going to have to be taken by Manila. I was also concerned that the um, Philippine Navy unilaterally, this is a scenario, so you, you know, there's a certain artificiality, of course, but unilaterally uh, sent the helicopters in. Um, uh, my, my own personal view is that wouldn't happen, yeah. that Manila understands how important um, solidarity is as a source of dissuasion, because if Manila uh, or in these territorial disputes, any ally gets ahead of Washington and Washington has to pull them back, that's, a, that's, ex that's embarrassing and it's bad for deterrence. But it, but it happened in the scenario, so I think that was a concern. <clears throat> I mean, I agree with that. I think um, uh, these these crises can often be emotional uh, for the countries, um, and you have to deal with that emotion in your when you're trying to advise them how to get through a crisis. But at the end of the day, they know that they need our support if they're going to make it through this crisis. So they listen very carefully to the advice that we give them, uh, and because they want us to continue to you know to be there for them. Um, so it's a balance, uh, and that's what diplomacy is all about, is finding that right balance. Uh, thanks. Um, sharing my from ISIS. Uh, in this hypothetical uh, situation, if it, if it comes to actually trying to break through the uh, blockade and all that, um, how do you communicate to the ground commanders, you know, I mean, with what determination do you try to do that? You know, uh, I, I'm, yeah, it, it just seems to me as if the, the real trick here, I mean, the real tricky situation here is, you know, how much leeway do you give to the local commanders? How do you micromanage? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just don't know how that is possible without, yeah. The NSC never micromanages. <laughs> The whole process, but I think uh, one of the uh, it's, as this crisis builds up, I think one of the first things that uh, Commander Pacific Command would want to do would get to be a uh, would would de be de to deploy a uh, capable planning and liaison element, for lack of a better term, into the Philippines to be able to coordinate uh, from from top to bottom, also to provide. Uh, eyes and ears for the NSC, for the president, uh, some ground truth observations on, on, on what's going on. Um, in the longer term, uh, the uh, outside of the crisis, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to continue to build up Philippine capability, not just in maritime domain awareness, uh, but also in the ability to respond to it. Uh, incidents. Uh, like this are a lot less likely to occur if the Philippines had the capability to move quicker uh, than uh, the forces that fall in on top of the fishermen, for example, in, uh, in an area like this. The uh, uh, further on and heavy lifting diplomatically, because it hasn't worked yet, is some kind of agreement uh, around all of ASEAN and with China on uh, on accepted uh, fishery conditions. Uh, it's a matter of fact that illegal, ungoverned fishing has put virtually every fish species in the Pacific under severe pressure, and the end of this story is not a good one. Uh, so there's, there's numerous reasons to, to take this view and to work on, the, on some kind of regulation of fishing agreed to internationally, and that puts us on the side of the angels. But that's a long-term thing. That, that, certainly won't help in this crisis. I am Paul Pham from uh, the Federation of uh, Vietnamese American Communities of the USA. Yeah, everyone like to work out the crisis or dispute peacefully. Um, and uh, 
Uh, the United States access shifting to the Asia may provide the uh, mean to maintain the peace and the stability of the region. So when that uh, access shifting uh, policy will be completed. And secondly, many Americans believe that in the future, sooner or later, America will have the confrontation with China. Why not now? Because it will cost less. Instead of later, when China will be much stronger. Thank you. Sir. You know, um, I'm both a professor and a former policy guy, and um, professors of international relations theory assume countries decide to strike, uh, that they believe in power cycle theories and these other things, and make decisions to strike while they're still strong and so forth, and I don't think in reality that's how it works. Um, and so I couldn't imagine that um, being a serious, to be honest, a serious discussion in the situation room of the White House, maybe in your administration. <laughs> no, I mean, uh... <laughs> I'll just say, you know, listen, we're, we as a country, you know, we just have, uh, you know, just got out of Iraq, we're getting out of Afghanistan. There's not a, much of an appetite right now in the absence of a true crisis for further, you know, military adventures. And I think that as a policy matter, um, you know, the hope is that we're going to be able to uh, bring China into uh, a rules-based system. And a rules-based system, we have to live by a rules-based system, and we have to live by that example. If we turn into, you know, might makes right, then um, then I don't think we want to live in that type of world, uh, and uh, the cost would be very high. So, you know, I think that uh, Mike's right that there's not much, very much of a constituency, both in public opinion nor in policy circles, for any type of military confrontation with China in this particular environment. Chris. Um. It's a uh, tempting option, and I know that, that a lot of our <laughs> friends and allies, including Vietnam, sometimes get frustrated with, uh, with, with U.S. action. But as Secretary Shapiro said, it's settled U.S. policy that we support the peaceful reintegration of China into the international system that enabled China's rise. Uh, at the same time, we are uh, obligate, we have a, we have treaties with, with Japan and the Philippines, Thailand, Australia, and the Republic of Korea to come to their defense. Uh, at the same time, we're obligated by law to take certain actions if there's uh, coercion or aggression against Taiwan. Uh, we have a vital economic relationship with China. Every one of our friends has a vital economic relationship with China. So this requires a high degree of skill and subtlety that uh, has sometimes been difficult for us to show. Um, Vietnam's uh, under pressure from the uh, uh, oil drilling rigs, that's understood. Uh, the, um, it's going to be a while before we work out of this. Uh, one of the things that I think that all of us can collectively do better is to make sure that we, we control the narrative, that we have information dominance, that, uh, that we do not allow China to write the only story about this, this reactive assertiveness where they declare that they're sovereign over this island that we were playing in this scenario here. And then as soon as there's some otherwise minor incident, the arrest of an illegal fisherman or fishermen, plural, it suddenly escalates, escalates into a crisis, and it's an insult to the sovereignty of 1.4 billion Chinese people. Uh, we need to get our story out there better. We need to make sure our story gets past the leadership and to the, and, and to the Chinese people so that uh, the folks that do believe in the rule of law in China, the folks that do believe on a peaceful reintegration into the international system, let alone uh, reaching the uh, responsible stakeholder that, uh, that Bob Zellick uh, uh, tried to characterize uh, the relationship with some years ago is, is very important. Um, there is 
they're, they're, the, the spirit that's working now where uh, nations in the region, in addition to the United States, are working to build capacity in various nations, including Vietnam and the Philippines, has got to continue and accelerate. And it's just, just, not just military capability. It's foreign direct investment. Uh, it's other things. And our friends in Japan are the uh, number three, four, five, depending on who you talk to, foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investor in Vietnam. They're very high on the uh, ranks of foreign direct investors in the Philippines, building infrastructure, building capability uh, to be able to control what's happening on the seaward frontiers, to be able to uh, react appropriately is, is going to be ever more important in the future, and it's going to require considerable effort, I think, on all of our parts. Uh, thanks. Uh, great discussion. Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Uh, never let me play these games because I always end up starting a war because it, it just seems more interesting. But this is really much more interesting. Uh, although I have to think the professor's question out there, that's the first year of the payload administration. That would be the first question. But anyway. Um, commercial note. Yeah, right. Uh, well, it would be entertaining. Um, I, one of the things I really got out of this morning discussion, which was fascinating, was how highly personal uh, what China's doing is to Xi Jinping himself, uh, you know, his view of history and what he wants. And that got me thinking, uh, you know, things like hotlines, and it got me thinking, uh, President getting on the phone and saying, you know, Dimitri, can't we work this out, you know? Uh, if you, those of you who remember Dr. Strangelove. Uh, but I then began to wonder, Mike, you were on the NSC for the Hainan Island crisis, as I recall, right? You were there. And you saw that one. And it's not quite the conundrum that, w that the scenario covered, but it absolutely was a you know, face to face US China military uh, confrontation. What, what is the role of the president uh, in trying to diffuse something like this directly and not necessarily working you know, through the assistant secretaries for weeks and months? It, 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 how soon do, do we think in terms of, of the hotline and the conversation? Uh, what is the president's role in, in the modern age with, with all the mass communication and the speed of decisions that are required? Is there more of a role now for that kind of highly risky but very personal diplomacy? Or is it very, very processed, which is, I think, what you guys were talking about? Thanks. Maybe Bob will speak to the point on Xi Jinping, but I agree with the premise of the question. I think Xi Jinping is, in my view, not just responding to domestic pressures. He personally, and Bob alluded to this in his opening brief, <clears throat> um, has a higher tolerance for risk and a, and a focus on power and uh, on domestic and international <clears throat> politics ending up in, um, in greater power for him and for the PRC. On, on the on the EP3 incident, um, what we found uh, was that um, the president was extremely important because nobody up to the level of the president had the ability to, uh, in an authoritative way, discuss an outcome with the Chinese counterparts. Um, our ambassador in Beijing thought he could do it, and he couldn't. He didn't have the right access. Paycom thought they could do it. They couldn't. They didn't have the right access. Um, uh, it, it was a case where the foreign ministry did not know, in some cases we knew more than the foreign ministry knew, about what the PLA Air Force had been up to. Um, and the President Bush wrote this in his memoirs, but he had to call 12 times before he could finally get Jiang Zemin to pick up the phone. So, I mean, and in that case, uh, in that case, you know, the plane was brought down on Hainan Island and the crew was being taken care of, it was not uh, ripe for, uh, it, it was not a situation like we were talking about today where, in, where inaction or time was going to lead to escalation. Today we face a situation where U.S. inaction was going to lead to this escalation. Um, and so it was not as intense. Um, but the mechanisms weren't there. And I, my sense is they're no better today, to be honest. I mean, Bonnie's nodding and I think she'd know well. I just don't think they're any better today. So if we did this with a little more time, one of the major discussions and major efforts would be to think about how we use this crisis to try to turn lemons into lemonade and try to get a better um, mechanism with China. And maybe the somewhat um, tough stance we were discussing is what you have to do to try to get that across to Beijing. I don't know. I'll, I'll just weigh in, in in support of the question. Uh, I think that that the the notion of of when the president should engage on this and at what at, at what level and and what kinds of points he should try to make uh, in the discussion, you know, one on one with Xi Jinping or through the interpreters, uh, is certainly uh, something that should be considered early, uh, and that it would be it would 
I'm not sure I agree with the idea that things don't work better uh, now than they did uh, 12 years ago. Uh, I fa in fact, I think that, that on the basis of the Sunnylands discussion and so forth, uh, that, that there would be at least a prospect for um, not a breakthrough, but at least a civil discussion uh, on the issue rather than allowing uh, distant signals and messaging and so forth to take the place of conversation. Uh, Carl Thayer, um, Mr. Chair, Defense Force Academy, University of New South Wales. <clears throat> I guess I'm speaking as a desk officer. And if we're going to approach, the U.S. is going to approach China on this, uh, bring up that the BRP Sierra Madre is a commissioned ship in the Philippines Navy, despite its derelict status. And, in, you know, in a debarge to China, my recommendation for you, principles, is to separate the fishermen from an alteration of the status quo around Second Thomas Shoal. And, and quietly tell the Chinese that uh, treaty obligations, that is a warship in the Philippines Navy, and the status quo isn't going to be upset, and those men are going to be provisioned. And then I would also foreshadow that at some point the Philippine Marines might invite their American counterparts, after this is over, to join them for a maritime reconnaissance mission where the U.S. and Philippines resupply them. Not changing status quo, but the, I mean, that's, that's the line. It's a commission ship in the Philippines Navy. That's how they see it. That's no go for, ch for China. I agree. <laughs> You've given us a good analysis and good recommendations about a crisis involving the Philippines. What difference would it make if offshore the Paracels, the oil rig leads to a similar confrontation? I think it's harder in some, it's easier in some respects and it's harder in some respects. It's harder because the, um, there's no security treaty. And because uh, the government of Vietnam um, uh, maintains its own, it does not coordinate with us and would not likely coordinate with us. I think with Manila as a treaty ally, the scenario notwithstanding, past episodes notwithstanding, in general, we can coordinate. Um, it'd be easier, in my view, Ernie knows this better, it'd be easier because in general Vietnam has been able to um, exercise restraint in these crises and be a little more predictable than Manila. Um, uh, and has, the other reason it'd be easier is because Viet Viet Vietnam has a more capable military on its own. I, I don't, you know, the other piece of it is, of, is that one of the ways in which Vietnam communicates with the PRC is through the Communist Party. And so they could use that avenue as well to have discussions with the Chinese in a way that the Philippines, you know, the relationship is a totally different one. Well, on the one hand, Vietnamese nationalism is, um, it would be something that the Vietnamese government would have to manage, um, as we've seen over these last few months. At the same time, they history of, you know, communication through the, by the Communist Party would probably provide some avenues for discussions as well. This gentleman over here. Thanks. I'm Ian Henry from the Australian National University. You all spoke about uh, the need to consider the reactions of allies during this crisis, uh, particularly those in the San Francisco system, uh, the hub and spoke system of alliances. Uh, perhaps you, if you could talk a little bit about how you consider interactions within the US-Filipino Treaty to be affecting those, because it also does occur to me that you might actually have divergent preferences amongst those allies. Tokyo might be looking for a quite a muscular response here. They might see a parallel with the Senkaku Islands. But it occurs to me that perhaps Seoul and Canberra might view this as the US being sort of goaded into conflict or dragged into conflict by a rogue ally. I'll just say, you know, obviously uh, different countries have different ways of um, perceiving the situation in the region, and that's what a large part of our diplomacy uh, is driven by um, discussions, dialogue, trying to come to common understandings of the security situation um, uh, to explain how the United States is approaching it. Uh, if there are gaps, to come up with ways to bridge those gaps. Uh, what I've found is, is that um, uh, there is a broad desire for the United States to play, you know, uh, uh, a significant role in the Asia-Pacific region by our partners and allies. 
they each have their own particular, you know, issues that they want us to focus on. Um, and some of them, you know, they want us there, but they don't want us there too much because that could upset the status quo too much. And it's all part of what is, is part of diplomacy is ex trying to explain, you know, your position, finding common ground, working together where you have far common ground, trying to convince the others that, you know, your position is one that will serve both interests. And that's why we have just, you know, robust dialogues with all the countries that you mentioned um, that, you know, not just at the principles level, which exists, but throughout the bureaucracies. I, um, it's a good question. Um, I think for uh, any U.S. government in a situation like this, as we would think through what outcomes we want to avoid, one of them would be splits in the San Francisco splits, splits among U.S. allies. I mean, the point of uh, reinforcing dissuasion or deterrence against unilateral coercion by Beijing um, has to be, in part, that we're um, demonstrating to China that the more they do this, the more solidarity there is among other maritime states to not let them do it. So any policy would have to, or strategy would have to, uh, uh, I shouldn't say have to, would, would seriously need to take under consideration um, solidarity among allies. Because an outcome where maybe we de-escalate, but we have splits, obvious splits, uh, would actually hurt us in the longer term goal. That said, and the recent utterances of Malcolm Fraser notwithstanding, um, I personally think the Abbott and Abe governments would be in lockstep on this, especially if you look at the summit uh, a few days ago. Have no doubt about that. Um, Korea's tougher. Uh, I think uh, I think the Pakune government has uh, a sober view of China, and but also a hopeful view of, of relations with China. Um, but in general, in these kinds of things, Seoul has kept its head down. And so I don't think we'd see a quote unquote defection and we wouldn't ask for much from Seoul, uh, I suspect in this scenario. Um, but it would have to be a consideration, I think, uh, to make the long-term effects of the strategy work. Um, my name is Aaron, I'm from Hudson. I wanted to ask, you said that um, you think there should be more surveillance in the South China Sea to uh, clarify things. Do you think the U.S. should have uh, unarmed surveillance drones in order to help with that surveillance? And if so, do you foresee a kind of code of conduct since drones are a new development? <coughs> drones are very useful things. Uh, they might be useful in a situation like that, but I'm speaking more of the, uh, ra of the system of radars that we put in in the, uh, Sulu and in the areas surrounding the Sulu and the Celebes Seas to shut down the uh, migration of uh, extremists in that interesting maritime triangle uh, among the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Uh, we had, prior to the installations of those radars, uh, been operating two ships out there, one a high-speed catamaran that we got from Australia, another one a uh, floating staging base for our special operations forces, and that was pretty expensive to be chasing people around without any information on where we were looking. We installed these radars and it shut down the uh, traffic uh, nearly completely because we knew who was moving where and the authorities in each country were able to cooperate with the other two uh, without any violations of feelings of sovereignty or anything to shut that down. It occurs to me that with the continued prevalence of rule of law issues and their enforcement in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, that maybe making the same data available to every country involved might be very useful, and this can be done with surface uh, in installations. Drones later, maybe, uh, who, who knows? I mean, that's a technical question, but I think that it, that it can be done initially anyway without uh, getting to that question if that's gonna be difficult. I'd like to uh, thank the members of the cabinet and the, and the NIO uh, and the National Security Advisor uh, <clears throat> for briefing us today. Uh, you guys were good, uh, um, uh, good, um, good sen you had a good sense of humor to uh, take that on, and uh, I know it wasn't an easy uh, exercise, but I do think it does reveal at the end of this uh, day of discussions about uh, complex issues how hard it is to think about and, and synthesize uh, these inputs and, and then try to make decisions, make policy uh, based on it. So I want to thank you all. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for uh, coming for the first day. Uh, I thought we had a great uh, discussion. Thank you for the panelists. Uh, 
We will start again tomorrow morning. Uh, registration, uh, I think, begins at 8, and the first keynote is at uh, 8.30. So uh, get some rest, and uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you again, panel, for, for your... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.